Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk, as we continue on in our look at the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we'll be continuing on. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. You are the light of the world. Uh, last week, we took a little interlude to just look at evangelism, because the salt of the earth, being the salt of the earth and being the light of the world, is about basically evangelism. It, this is Christ preparing his disciples to go out to be that witness for him to the world. Mm -hmm. right? right? We are ambassadors for Christ. Hallelujah. That's a good thing to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, we're going to start, and the light of the world, this may seem a, not so much like a Bible lesson as much as a High school science class. <laughs> okay. Now, the danger in that, of course, is that most people don't like high school science. All right? And that's because the schools have it all wrong. Did you study high school science at all? Okay. So you learned about our solar system? Mm -hmm. yes. I tried yes. not to. Yes, you did. You know about our solar system. And therein lies the problem. Because it all starts with a lie. It is not... Our solar system, it is his solar system. That's right. All science, any science class, any science, anything, has to start with this. In the beginning, God created. If you don't start from that foundation, I don't care how brilliant you are, how many degrees you have, you're going to get it wrong. Okay? It's as simple as that. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. All right? It says, when I consider, David prayed, when I consider your heavens, it's his heavens. It's not, it's his solar system, it's not ours. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, we're going to go on, and there's a reason for this. Because creation was not an accident that came out of chaos. No. It wasn't about a big bang. No. It started with a word. Yes. Let there be light. Now, I have to take a second just to share a little bit of my testimony because you'll see why, all right? Before I got saved, and when I was on, when I, before I got saved, I was very unsaved. I, everybody has pride. Everybody in the world, I mean, this is, this is the issue, is we think more of ourselves. And especially in the perilous last days, when the first thing that Paul wrote to Timothy was that men will be lovers of self. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly had a lot of pride before I got saved. Uh, I, we were, we were blessed. We had success. I worked, I worked for one of the biggest corporations in the world at the time. I was a consultant in New York City. We had a lovely home in the suburbs. I had the sports car. I had the Corvette and we had the, the luxury car and all these things. And I used to measure everything by what I had compared to what other people had. Mm -hmm. And, and I had quite a bit. I mean, I was, so I had this pride inside of me. But I would go out on a starry night and I would look up into the sky and I would look at the stars and I would feel crushed because I would feel so totally insignificant, so tiny. You know, if I compared myself to that guy over there, I could, I could work my way around that. But if I compared myself to God's creation, and I didn't think of it that way, it would literally get me depressed. I mean, Alice would have me not to go out and look at the stars. Don't, don't I mean, look at the stars. It really was. <laughs> So now I had been raised a, a Roman Catholic. I had gone to Catholic schools all my life. Mm -hmm. But on my birthday, my 33rd birthday, I sat down at my kitchen table, Alice and her other sister. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'll, I'll let you do the introductions here in a minute. We'll pray, right? Uh, had gone out to get a birthday cake for me, and I was sitting at my table. Alice had actually gotten saved a month before me. And she had brought a Bible into the house. We'd never had a Bible. I had never, I was 33 years old, been through 12 years of Catholic school. I had never read a Bible. Missiles, that kind of thing, prayer sure. Books. Prayer books, but never the Bible. 
And I went over, I saw Alice's Bible sitting on top of the refrigerator. And I went over and I grabbed it and I sat down at the table and I just flipped it open and I said, Jesus, if you are real, I want to know. And I opened to this, I opened it and I looked down and this is what I saw. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet, you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. And I heard a voice say to me, not only am I real, but I know exactly what's in your heart. That was the end of my life as I knew it. Everything changed that moment. The, star, the moon and the stars, and I would say this all the time, the moon and the stars humbled me. When I was preaching in Florida a number of years ago, at, at a little church in Central Florida, and I was sharing this. And as I shared it, and I said how the moon and the stars humbled me. I heard God speak to me. And I'm preaching. I'm in the middle of the sermon. And God said, no, you're wrong. Now, it's quite a feeling to be preaching a sermon. And all of a sudden, have God tell you, no, you're wrong. So I said, excuse me a second. And I turned around. And I said, Lord, what? And he said, it wasn't the moon and the stars that humbled you. He said, it was my glory that humbles you. Yes. Because it says the heavens declare the glory of God mm -hmm. and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands mm -hmm. in Psalm 19. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> it did. It humbled me. You know, David said, when I consider the moon and the stars, have you ever seen a full moon? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we lived on the water. We've lived on the water many times in Central America and Miami. And you see that full moon on the, on the water. Mm -hmm. It's magnificent. And it can be almost as bright as the sun. Yeah. So you've seen it. Did you consider it? Did you ever stop and say, Lord, what are you saying? Because here's the deal. God's plan from the beginning is that we see him and learn about him through what he's made. All right? right. Paul wrote in, in Romans chapter 1, and he said, For since the creation of the world, his, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Romans 1.20. See, so this, this lesson that we're doing isn't about the moon. It's from the moon. Mm -hmm. This is God speaking to us right. from that moon from that moon and the stars, right? And he created. In Genesis 1, it said, in the beginning, God created. In John 1, it said, in the beginning was the Word. Everything came from the Word. And the first thing that God created was light. All right. But he made two lights, right? Mm -hmm. He said that he, God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. Mm -hmm. So God starts the whole thing by making this light. But then man sinned. Adam sinned, right? Yes. And it says, For behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the people. Isaiah chapter 60. Mm -hmm. That sin brought darkness into God's creation. A darkness, a spiritual darkness mm -hmm. that is still hard for us to comprehend. Mm -hmm. But the promise from the beginning, God spoke through Isaiah also and said, But the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will appear upon you. The Gentiles will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. God promised, it's been prophesied from the beginning, God's gonna shine his light back into the world. All right, so in the fullness of time, a virgin gave birth in Bethlehem. And it says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil, John three nineteen. So Jesus, the light came into the world but men still love the darkness. Then Jesus spoke to them. Again, he spoke to them, to them again. He said, I am the light of the world. John 8, right? I am the light of the world. But then in John 9, he said, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But then he left. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. He's gone. He ascended into heaven. Hallelujah. So the moon is only bright when the sun is gone. I mean, it's oh. daytime right now. We go outside. Yeah. The moon's there. But you can't see it because of, this, because of the shining of the sun, right? But now 
that light, the great light, remember there's two lights, the great light and the lesser light. Mm -hmm. Jesus is that greater light, and he's gone. Mm -hmm. So now when he says in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. Mm -hmm. You're yes. the light of the world. Yes. But before you get too proud of yourself, <laughs> remember, Jesus, the Word of God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord, Isaiah 55. And it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5. I want to tell you about a fact about the moon. Right? This is a science class now. Okay. The moon has no light. The moon is a lump. It's a big rock up in the sky. It's not a light source. It doesn't have any light of its own. Now, this is why it says lean out on your own understanding. Because if God had come to me, or NASA, and said, here's the plan. We need to reflect my light, and we would have put the biggest, most beautifully polished mirror into the sky you ever saw in your life. We would have polished that thing. That's what would have been our plan. Mm -hmm. God chose a lump, a big <laughs> rock. It's the truth. Think about it. That's what he chose. It's his plan, because he speaks to us through this. God chooses the foolish. God chooses the weak. God chooses the least. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Mm -hmm. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. That's God's plan. Mm -hmm. It's not because we're so special. It's not because we're so bright. It's because God wants the glory. Yes. That's why. That's right. That's right. Yet, it, being nothing but a rock, but the moon affects the tides. It affects everything on earth. Yeah. I want to tell you a fact about the moon. The moon, the moon to the sun, right? The moon is 400 times smaller than the sun. Got it? Okay. You may want to take notes. But it's 400 times <coughs> closer than the sun. Well, isn't that a coincidence? No, it's not. <laughs> this is God's amazing plan. So it appears to be the same size in the sky. You look at a full moon, and it appears to be the same size as it's not. But that's how God placed it in his perfect plan. We're not Jesus, but we bring his presence. It says, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. 2 Corinthians 2.14. God uses us to bring his presence. Where? Into the grocery stores, Right? into the shopping malls, into the workplace, into your home. You are the light that the Lord has chosen to place close to the, into the darkness in order to shine his light. I think that's pretty cool. I, I can get pretty excited about that, actually. I mean, I really can, because I think that's fascinating. I'll tell you a fact about the moon. Oh, you're writing all this down. It's a there may be a test. There's not always a full moon. Well, there actually is, but it's not always visible that way. Right? Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. The apparent size and brightness of the moon is determined by how much of the Earth, the world, is between the sun and the moon. The more of the world that's in the way, the less of the light. Yes. That's why you sometimes see a half moon, a sliver of the moon. Yes, it's because yes. <laughs> the world is blocking. It's standing between the moon and the sun and blocking that. Yes. Right? So if, if we let the world get totally between us and Jesus, between the sun, what you have is a lunar eclipse. <laughs> the light of the sun does not reach the moon. Now think about that. It says consider this. When you let the world get between you and the Lord, it dims his light in your life. And by the same token, if you let the moon get completely between the world and the sun, that's called a solar eclipse. And no light is seen from either. This is the danger of pride. If we put ourselves in front of God, so people see us instead of Him, there's no reflection of anything. All of a sudden, you can't see the light of the sun, you can't see the light on the moon, and you can't see any light on earth. It's just darkness. That's why the pride of the church, or individual Christians who would stand in front of Jesus so that they might be seen, Bring about darkness. 
Remember, without the light of the sun and the moon, the moon would never be, or the light of the sun, the moon would never be seen. The pride of the church hides the light of God. The, the world isn't going to hide it from us, no, right? No. Leonard Raven, you know, I, 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 great saint of God who wrote so much about revival, he said that the church alone can limit the Holy One of Israel. Satan has no power no, to block doesn't. the plan of God. No, He's been defeated. Right. But we have the ability to hide the light of God, yeah. okay? Hmm. I'm going to tell you a fact about the moon. You're writing these down, right? Okay. We only ever see one side of the moon. That's true. Yeah. Right? You know about the dark side of the moon? Mm -hmm. Since the rotational period of the moon is exactly the same as the orbital period, the same portion of the moon is always facing the earth. I don't know where that, right? Mm -hmm. That's why they say the dark side. Doesn't turn around. The, the, you, you never see one side of the moon. Yeah. It's always facing away from the earth. Always. All right? Mm -hmm. There's the dark side. Mankind only sees one side, never sees the dark side, but God sees both. Man sees the outside, God sees the heart. This would be, and should be, scary, except for the fact that it says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. We don't, God sees everything in our hearts. He sees the dark side of us. Okay. What we're trying to hide from what we're trying to hide from people, what we hide from, from the world. I want you to know that God sees. But God said, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. Isaiah 43, 25. And he says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 103, verse 11 and 12. You get that? I mean, this is, this is so important to understand. Because this is God revealing his plan. Revealing, revealing his nature. The fact that he would use us, our fallen human nature, he can use that in our lives. Why? Because he's, he, it's his light. Yes. It's just that lump of clay, People, that rock. It is so, it is so natural for us to want people to see us. And we have, no, we have nothing worth seeing. Yeah. You know, it, it has to get, this is what humility is about, is understanding that we're just a tool in the hand of God. Mm -hmm. And how gloriously he can use us by showing his glory through us. Yes. Okay. Amen. All right, so those are some facts about the moon. Now, I'm going to give you a fact about light, okay? Light is very nice. <laughs> it really is. That is a fact. It yes. is really. It really is. So I want to talk about two things here. That, and I, you probably know about these. A, a prism, you understand what a prism is? Yeah. You know, what a, a prism does. A prism splits the light, okay? You put light into a prism, and it comes out... A, it splits it up into its color components. Right. Now that's nice if you're talking about a rainbow, but that's what a rainbow is, is a prism. And God put that in the sky to remind, to remind us of his covenant with us. Yes. The word prism actually comes from the Latin word to saw, to cut, to divide. That's, where the, that's what a prism is. It divides the light. Right, yeah, that's right. Prism divide light. But then the light is dimmer, it's weaker, and only carries part of the quality of the original. Right. Okay? Now it says, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians, or should I say 1 Corinthians? I don't want to sound like Donald Trump. 1 Corinthians 1.10. Division diminishes the light. Now, you got to understand that. Do you understand that? Say it again. Division in the body of Christ diminishes, dims the light. Yes. yes. Well, if we recognize that truth, why are we not falling down on our faces before God and repenting of our division 
that we're so proud of, that we boast in. I'm a Lutheran. I'm a this. I'm a that. I'm in Jesus Christ. That's all that matters. That's the only thing that matters. Let there be no division among you. That is a command of God. I, you know, I, I have been preaching this gospel for, this is my 40th year. I pastor churches. One of the things that's always been on my heart is unity in the body of Christ. I've, I've worked every place that we have been. I've gone and tried to get pastors to come together, bring their bodies together. We, we never had, for example, which is fairly traditional in the States, Sunday night services. Well, what we would do, we'd have Sunday services, and we'd either have communion fellowship on Sunday evening, or we'd just all get up as a group and walk into somebody else's church service. Yeah, that's true. And we'd just go visit and, and do that. We need, to, we need to overcome this sin of division in our lives. We really, really do. We should be falling on our faces and repenting of that because it diminishes God's light. Gee, is it important? Well, I'll tell you this. I think Jesus thought it was important. He mentioned it, didn't he? <laughs> well, you know, I, I've said this before. As a matter of fact, I was preaching in Cameroon, Africa to a group of pastors from all over Africa and from Europe. I was teaching. And, and I said to them, well, I've been there for a week with them. And on this last night, they were going back on the following day. They were going back to wherever they'd come from. And I said to them, I want you to take a minute and just stop and think about what you're praying for. Now, these are all pastors. They should be praying people. I said, but I want you to think about the things that you're praying for. Now, let me ask you a question. What if you knew with absolute, total certainty that you would not make it home tomorrow? That tomorrow would be the last day that you ever spent on earth? How would that change your prayer life tonight? Yes. Stop and think about that. Yeah, it how, would you, it how would it change your prayer life? Think about what you're praying for. Think about the things that seem important to you now. And if you knew that tomorrow would be your last day on the earth, what would you be praying for? Because that's exactly where Jesus Christ was when he went into the garden the night he was taken. Mm -hmm. That's exactly, he knew it was over. And you know what he prayed? He prayed that they, this is what he said to the Father, that they may all be one. Even as you, Father, and me are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. He prayed for unity in the body. That's what he prayed for. I think it's important. And you know how important it is? Think about what I just said, what Jesus said, that we would be one so that the world might believe you sent me. You know, we can put all our programs together, we can do all our evangelism, but if we don't have unity, unity in the body, the world is not going to believe in Jesus Christ. That's division weakens the light. Yes. Jesus said, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. You can, you can preach all you want, you can hand out all the tracts, you can do everything you want, but if we're not, being, if we're not in unity, we are hiding the truth of God's love. That's right. Okay, I'm going to give you one more fact about light, okay? You're writing this down, aren't you? Okay, here's the fact about light. We talked about a prism. Now, kind of the opposite of a prism is a laser. Now, lasers, you know about laser technology. They do surgery with lasers. You can cut metal. You can, I mean, it's incredible what lasers do today. A laser, I went to the Discovery Channel how things work. Mm -hmm. And I read about lasers. A laser is a device that emits light based on the stimulated emission of photons. Wow. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean, Mr. Science? <laughs> it means that the light of a laser is basically, it's, it's exciting. It's, they stimulate, right? Okay. It's focused. It's all. It's not it's not broad. Just, I mean, yeah. a, a laser, as you find out, is it's I've focused. Got a it's one yeah. frequency. It has to be. You know, light has light waves, different. Mm -hmm. But in order to, for a laser to work, it has to be all of the same frequency that, that focuses it. Think about that one. Well, let me say it one more time. A light of a laser is excited, okay. focused, and one frequency. Spiritually, we got to get excited. Mm -hmm. by Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. We got to get focused. We have to be single-minded. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we have to be one frequency, unified, the same mind and the same judgment. Mm -hmm. 
Because now all of a sudden, it's not like putting a flashlight on the wall. A laser can cut right through virtually anything, right? Mm -hmm. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. They do surgery with it. They do microsurgery with it. It's incredible. The power of a laser is incredible. The power of the church, the light that comes from the church, should have that same power to cut through the darkness, to cut through the, the, the trash and the river. We have that. We do have So that. where is it? The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as, as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews 4.12 we, we just don't understand. If we understood the glory of this simple truth when you consider the moon and the stars, the sun, when you understand that God is speaking to us through them and saying, I, if I can do that with that lump of rock out in the sky, think of what I can do with you in my hand, the body of Christ. So the answer, the sermon that God is preaching here through the moon, when we consider the work of his hands, is this. Just walk, stand, bask in the light of the Lord. The moon doesn't strive. The moon doesn't sit in the sky and go and, and try and turn itself on. It just it just is there in the presence of God. It doesn't struggle to generate light. Here is the work that we are to do. Isn't that what the disciples came? The disciples, they, therefore they came and they said to him, what shall we do so that we, we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. John 6, 28 and 29. It's him. Less than any man should boast. We have nothing to boast in. It says, you know, we're to, in this, here in the Sermon on the Mount, it says, we're to, let, we're to do our works in such a way that men see it and, and give glory to God the Father. That's right. Our lives are about shining the light of God. And if we try and shine the light and claim it to be our own, we hide God. We have the power to bring the most Powerful thing in the world, God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, mm. who spoke everything into existence. We can bring his presence in, which is what we're supposed to do, or we can hide his presence. And you know, the world can't do anything about that. They can try and extinguish the fire. They can try and they can try and put out the light. But the fact of the matter is, you know, it's like God said to and Isaiah, you know, go ahead. He said it to the enemy. Devise a plan, but I'll thwart it. The enemy is defeated. We should be living in that high victory and be able to say like the Apostle Paul, I walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. And people should see the love of God, the peace of God, the joy of God radiate forth from you. Yes. You need to be a laser. So you need to get excited. You need to get excited about Jesus Christ. Enough of this pickle-faced church where we sit around. We need to get excited about Jesus Christ. We need to get focused on Jesus Christ. Yes. We need to start loving one another as he loved us. That's the commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. That's the commandment. Mm -hmm. We have such wonderful things to be doing in the name of Jesus Christ, if only we will. And Father, I thank you that you can use us. If you can use that ball or rock in the sky, mm -hmm. you can use us for the glory of your name. You can shine forth the light of your son, Jesus Christ, through our lives. I thank you for that, Lord God, that you can still, still use us even while we're foolish, while we're weak, Lord God. I praise you and thank you, Lord, that you choose to use us for the glory of your name. God bless you, Father, in the name of our Son, Jesus Christ, your Son. Until next time. See you next time. Amen.